Hey everyone. Um, now, next speaker is uh, Mike Demo, uh, and uh, he is going to talk about A-B testing. Which way does your duck face? So without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Mike. Hey, thanks, Roland. Really appreciate that wonderful intro. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session of Modicon. I am so excited to be here. It is currently 8 a.m. where I am in Minnesota. This is actually my second talk of the day. I gave a lightning talk earlier in track six, which you can check out the recordings uh, when those go live later. But we're here to talk about ducks. Yes, ducks. This talk is called A-B testing. Which way does your duck face? So without further ado, let's get into it. So my name is Mike Demo. I'm an open source evangelist, and but my title is Lead Hand Shaker for Web Ventures. Web Ventures is a company that invests in open source products, mostly WordPress plugins and WordPress based companies, but overall the entire um, uh, you know, world, and you can learn more about that at uh, webventures.io. My email is mikedemo at webventures.io, not.com. Again, I did the edit of the slide early this morning. My Twitter is at mpmike. It's the best way to get a hold of me. Just tweet at me, um, questions, comments, whatever you have, I will respond to you. Um, and you make sure to use the hashtags, hashtag modicon and hashtags modicon2020. Um, my LinkedIn and Twitter are on the screen as well. I would love to uh, connect with you. Um, I am a big WordPress uh, fan, but I actually started in the Joomla world, um, very similar to the roots that Modic has. Um, I, Joomla was my first uh, open source content management system. I used to be on the board of Joomla, and I just have a passion for it now. I'm a WordPress evangelist, but overall, I uh, you know, just love open source, and I'm so happy to be here. So let's talk about A-B testing. And before we do that, let's we're going to talk about some ducks. So ducks are great, right? Everyone loves ducks. And everyone probably is seeing this talk mostly because of the title. I've given this talk over 100 times over the past five years. It's it, probably my most requested talk that I have given. Um, and they were like, why does it matter? So the question, which way does your duck face? So we're going to... What, what, why is it called that? Well, there was a study and it was a landing page and it was all talking about uh, what would perform better. And they had a picture of a duck and they had the duck facing to the right and then the duck facing to the left. And it was all about which one converted better. And one, one of those directions converted 80% more than the other one. Well, why would that be? I'll tell you the answer on which one converted more at the end, but we're gonna like talk about A-B testing in general. Uh, first off, for those of you that don't know uh, A-B testing or split testing, in its simplest terms, it's just, it's just taking two different variations of something and seeing which one performs better. So, for example, if you have a picture of a blue box and a bl red box and the blue box um, you know gets more signups let's say it was a newsletter signup form or something like that on your landing page then the blue box in that a b test because that's the variable you change would you know perform better but you can get very complicated with a b testing but a lot of people don't really know where to start or they kind of just you know don't do it with a strategy so that's mainly what this talk is to be about if you have any questions please uh, make sure to share them there should be a link popping up at some time during the talk um, please make sure to give all your questions uh, there and we'll answer those at the end yep right there at the bottom of the screen submit your questions um, at that URL and we'll get to as many of them as we can. This is normally an interactive talk where I'm like asking questions and saying, you know, uh, talking to people, but you know, we'll do the best we can in the online format. So first off, I'm not going to bury the lead. What is the big secret of web professionals? What is the biggest secret that we're all hiding? And you might not even know it. I mean, you know it, but you might not even no, it's a secret, but it's it's a big secret and something that we don't talk about at all in the web professional world. And I just, 
I find it so funny. Um, but the big secret of web professionals, are you ready for this? Is we're all guessing. We are all guessing. Whenever we make a landing page, whenever we make a website, we are guessing. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mike Demo, if that is your real name. <laughs> I, I'm not a, I don't guess. I'm a professional. I know best practices and I know what converts and I know this and that and I know how to make a website that you know will do everything a hundred percent of the time 10% of the time whatever it is and that's true we are professionals and there are things such as best practices there are things that we can do to make our landing pages perform better there are things that we can do to make them more discoverable with SEO there are things that we can make them do to make them have a better user experience and have it better for the end user who's interacting with our content to be able to type it in but here's the thing no one set of users is exactly the same and you can't take a playbook that you did from site A and then apply it to site B and assume it's going to be a hundred percent the same and that is the main purpose of this talk we're going to talk about a lot of crazy examples uh, with a B testing and have some funny stories along the way but the bottom line the thing you should take away from this is that just because something worked in the past don't assume it's going to work in the future there are a lot of variables that you can't control and you know you want to make sure that you're doing the best that you can for the content that you're creating um, Albert Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results so this is kind of similar to the word guessing thing where maybe you're just doing the same thing and you're not getting results so maybe you're not getting the performance that you want from your site and you don't know why and you think you've heard about this a b testing thing and you don't really know what to do or maybe you've done some a b testing or split testing and you've just kind of changed stuff right you're like well i'm gonna try a new uh, tagline or a new heading or a new call to action on the button maybe i'll try some different stock images and you'll just try different things or more often than not what i see most of the time is specifically with landing pages when people are a b testing landing pages is they're not testing small things on the landing pages such as a call to action or an offer they are like completely throwing out redesigning the whole page you know, maybe one is a simple uh, landing page with, you know, a very simple layout. And then the other one is a long form landing page with testimonials and videos and all this stuff. Yeah, one might perform better than the other, but it doesn't tell you why. It doesn't tell you what the specific piece of the change um, was the reason why. So, um, first thing you, is you have to have a purpose before you work on any piece of content be it a website or a landing page, whatever it is, think about the purpose of that content. What is your KPI? What is your key performance indicator? Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, that's easy. I want to sell more. I want to get more newsletter signups or I want more people to uh, convert at this stage of the funnel or whatever it is. Yeah, but that's not really a purpose. It's just what you want to have happen so if you may also and if you're serving this for clients what is their purpose and what are they're going to define success i once talked to a web developer and they were like man i really um had this client and it was a uh, utility and they cared most about bounce rate they said we want bounce rate is our number one priority so our agency did everything we could to reduce the bounce rate. For those of you that don't know, bounce rate is the percentage of visitors that hit a website and don't do any action and just leave. So they bounce off. And so they were doing whatever they could to decrease the bounce rate, to getting people to be more sticky, stay on the site longer. And they presented it and the work was good. But here's the thing is the client was very unhappy. The client was like, our bounce rate has gone down down and they're like yes your bounce rate has gone down isn't that great you used to have all of the you used to have 50 percent of people that would only hit your website and leave now only 20 percent of people are doing that they're interacting with your site isn't that great and they're like no 
we want our bounce rate to be as high as possible. And the agency's like, well, that makes no sense. Why would you want your bounce rate to be high? And this is what I mean by have a purpose and don't assume everything's the same. You have to have these conversations and you have to dig in deeper. So they said, okay, well, why do you want your bounce rate to be high? They said, we're a utility. Um, it was a Canadian uh, utility. Uh, we are a public service. We define success if our visitors to our site can find the answer without clicking. Therefore, you know, search engine optimization obviously is important to them. So for example, if someone's wanting to know if there's a power outage, they should be able to do that without having to click the site. So if they Google powder outage in Alberta, Canada, they should be able to know that answer on the first page that they hit. That's a very different use case. And you could say, well, the client could have done a better job of explaining what they were wanting. Well, it's true. But it's our job as the professionals to ask the questions. So I always recommend before you do any project, write down the goal, write down your SMART goal. You know, going back to college, um, the SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, and have time constraints on them. If you don't have those four things on your goal or your purpose on your KPI, then you really don't have a goal. And don't give up until you have that written down on paper. And if you're doing work for a client, take it a step further and figure out what the specific numbers are for them to define success. So if they say, I care most about people that sign up for the newsletter on our landing page. Okay, great. Um, it, why do you care about that? Well, if they're on our newsletter, we know that so many, many percentage, blah, 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 you know, converts. Okay, so your goal is to increase um, the newsletter signups. Well, it has to be smart. So a specific, you know, we said newsletter signup, so that is specific. Measurable, we can measure that. We can look to see how the number goes up. Um, attainable, yeah, we can probably do that. And time specific. So um, in what time constraint do you want that in? Let's say six months. Okay, great. So in six months, what is that number that you'll define success, Mr. Client or Mrs. Client? And what would be an you know, amazing number? I had this, um, I did this little project for a toy store in New York and it was early in the pandemic they were focused on physical sales and this uh, and they said and they had to go online quickly because they were all shuttered because of COVID and I said what do you want your goal annual goal for sales to be and they said about 40,000 would be great for uh, online sales okay great and they're like it would be amazing if we could get 65,000 you know this year and I'm like, but they're like, <laughs> the, the exact words were, well, a girl can dream, right? And it was an old retired woman who owns it. And I was like, okay, great. So that's what we use for measurements. You know, it was just a small project. It did, you know, just a handful of hours for them. And as of now, we kept that in our sites and everything we did was focused on that goal, even though it was a little project for me. Well, now they're at $98,000 for this year, the year we're in right now. And I didn't start working with them until about a month into COVID. So goals are so important. You have to be specific, but it's also important that you know what the number is for the client. Why is that so important? Because has anyone had the honeymoon period when you're working on a project and they're happy at the beginning and then time goes on, not really happy anymore because it wasn't doing what they expected. Well, if, the no if they said, if you hit this, I'll be happy and this I'll be ecstatic and you hit this, then they have no legs to stand on. And I know people that even engage their um, additional contract bonuses based on those numbers. And you, know, you can look at that if that makes sense for you. So um, it all goes to challenging the client. You know, Don't take what they t um, want at face value. Sometimes the clients don't even know what they need. I once had, when I was doing agency work, we had a food company and they told us, that uh, we care most about college students. The sororities and the fraternities, they're our bread and butter. They're where we make most of our money. 
and we want to focus all of our marketing on that. And we're like, okay, great. So then we started doing mock-ups and you know wonderful designs based on that demographic. But then our wonderful research team and project managers, they started digging in and looking at the analytics and looking at the data. And there was no university IPs hitting the website, their current site. And we said, why do you think this is your demographic? Well, it's, you know, it, uh, whenever we go to colleges, we just see everyone with it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, who, explain that to us. Well, it turns out the marketing manager used to just graduate from college. And he was also the son of the, of the owner of the company. So he had a bunch of this free product and he gave it out to his friends. So everyone in his circle of influence loved this product. Loving the product is fine, but if they're not the ones that are best on looking for it, this product had a unique feature. It was actually pretty healthy and it was natural and had no added sugar. And it was the only type of its kind in the marketplace that had no added sugar. You know who was looking for the product? New moms that were trying to feed their kids a better alternative to this staple. And so if we wouldn't have challenged the client, we would have gone and did a huge marketing campaign, hundreds of thousands of dollars towards the wrong demographic. So don't assume the client knows best. You need to make sure that you know who you're working for um, first. And then you want to make a plan. Um, this, sorry, that's not readable. Um, my slides converted, and you know, into a new software, and uh, that's should say make a plan. I apologize for that. Um, and so when you take a plan. The first thing to do with A-B testing is look at the project. If you take it on an existing project and you are doing changes or something or you have something you already have and you just want to make it better with A-B testing, write down, have a brainstorming session, everything you think that will make that perform better. You know, from the simple stuff to like change the colors of the buttons, call to action, copy changes, graphics changes, blah, 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 blah. Write it all down, all of it down and then prioritize it based on what you think will be most impactful based on your experience as a professional um, and order it. And then you have your plan. We're gonna take that plan in a, little, uh, in a minute, but that's the first thing you wanna do is write down everything you think, you know, live chat, phone numbers, whatever you wanna do. Write that all down and then prioritize it based on most business impactful for the goal that we already talked about. Um, and everything needs to be statistically relevant. What do I mean by statistically relevant? When you do A-B testing, if you only have 100 visitors and let's say only half of them interact with your, with your stuff, one interaction can skew your results immensely. Um, I usually ask here, who here is a data scientist or has a PhD in data analytics? And everyone just laughs and I'm like, what? you? don't have a PhD in data analytics and you're in the web and open source, source space, you're in the wrong business. You, you need to have these things to be, to make web, to make web content. And everyone laughs. Although one time I gave this talk, they're like, yep, Harvard PhD. I'm like, great here. You can finish the talk. And then I sat down. Okay. I didn't really sat down, but I did say you could finish the talk and the, he didn't really want to, but, um, so there are programs out there that will help you know if something's statistically relevant. Um, I use VWO, which stands for Visual Website Optimizer. It will just tell you when you do your tests, when you load them in, if it's within the margin of error, you know, and all sorts of stuff. There are a lot of ways to do A-B testing. You can do it manually with um, tools like Modic um, or whatever you want to do. And you can just say, okay, well, for the first week, I am going to try this. And then the second week, I'm going to try this and then see what one performs better. You can use things like, uh, you know, Google has an A-B testing tool that, you, you know, will change it dynamically. Optimizely will also change it dynamically with a little bit of JavaScript. VWO does the same thing with JavaScript. The nice thing about the tools, it'd be Google, Optimizely, VWO, or others, that do it with JavaScript, not the source, is there's two reasons why it's good. Number one, you're not making any changes to the root content until you know a winner. 
which means Google isn't indexing anything that isn't the core original content. The worst thing you can have happen is Google indexing a test variable if it doesn't want to be there, if it's not going to be there permanently. So that's a good, a good thing. It will also tell you if a test is statistically relevant or not automatically in a nice user-friendly format. You can do the math manually. You can Google it and find some formulas and things. I'm not that guy. I like the program to say, yep, the thing's a winner, or no, it's not, or we don't know yet. So um, for what it's worth. Um, also, if you um, do it manually, things can change week to week, right? Maybe your SEO got better. Maybe you did a social media campaign or a PP, uh, paid ad campaign, and that got more visitors up. So doing it manually is hard to know success. That's why tools kind of make it easier. Uh, change the temp. Uh, you know, try different things, um, be a little weird, and we'll kind of talk, we're going to give some examples of some weird things you can do. So you go back to that list, and you did everything based on, um, you know, business impact. Now, when you're doing those changes, and you're looking at the variables, you might just think, well, I'm just going to make the offer very similar, um, or I might make it just a slightly different shade of blue. When you do your changes, I find it's better to do drastic changes first and then hone in on the more minute changes because drastic um, variable changes will tell you if um, you're going in the right direction or not. And then you can tune it in over time. So some things you can, um, you know, A-B test, buttons. You can do so many things with buttons. You can, you know, change the color, change the position, change the rounding on the border radius, make it, you know, square or not, add shadows. Um, funny thing about shadows on buttons. Uh, I once did a, um, a landing page for, I was on a team, um, we did it for a national insurance company here in the States. And they cared most about applications. So that was their KPI. Okay, great. We tested everything. We paid for a focus group to figure out which language and, you know, stock photos and stuff that we uh, liked most. We were getting maybe a percent here, two percent there boost up and down. It was, but it was not anything statistically relevant. We got almost like an 85 percent increase on applications. You know how we did it? We added a two pixel drop shadow. Literally, that was the only change on the content was a two pixel drop shadow. Yes, I know I just said here, do the ma ma massive changes first on the variables, but sometimes it's the little things that make a difference. So, you know, at the end of the day, you just never know. I don't know why two pixel drop shadow converted 85% um, more. And they had millions and millions of visitors. I ran millions of people through this test, millions of people through this variable, and it proved out time and time again. I can't tell you why, but at the end of the day, it meant hundreds more applications for the client, and they were very happy. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, all that really matters. Text. So many different things you can do with text. You can change the tone of voice. You can change first person, third person. You can change what the offer is. You can change the font. You can change, uh, you know, if you, the font has letting or not. You can change the position. You know, uh, so many different things you can do with text. Images. So many things you can do with images. You can try clip art versus photorealistic images. You can try original photography versus stock photography. Some people in some demographics um, really respond well to stock photography. I know everyone says, oh, stock photography is awful. It doesn't do as well as original photography. And usually those are co uh, people that are photographers themselves. Um, yeah, original photography is great. It's not all clients can afford it or even create it. But at the end of the day, sometimes um, some demographics, and I've tested this, respond better to really, really cheesy stock photography. And if uh, other client people um, really respond negatively for stock photography. Uh, if you don't have original photos, you can't have original photos what you can do is there are stock photo companies that specialize in non-stock photo looking stock photos 
Yes, I know that is ironic, but it does exist. And there are a lot of different uh, places to find this. And, you know, just try different sorts of images. You can try different uh, treatments on the images. You know, again, drop shadows, overlays, you know, things like that. Um, again, uh, sorry about my slides being um, not readable on this new presentation. Uh, you want to just get stuff done, you know. Just at the end of the day, just keep working towards the goal. Don't assume one change is going to make all the difference in the world and then sit back and wait for the money to roll in. Test it, get the result, move on to the next thing. Again, go back to that list. Um, when you look at weird stuff to try, um, think about, you know, I recommend a good cadence to do is if you're doing four um, A-B tests a month, have one of them, 25%, be a weird test something that is so off the wall you don't think it's going to work and it probably won't you'll probably be right but one out of every 10 of those super weird off the wall tests will probably be the most successful um a b test you ran that month and that really can make a big difference for your kpi that's why i talk about just the crazy stuff think about the things that just don't make any sense there are, you know, there are people that uh, that really respond well to ugly websites, websites that aren't aesthetically pleasing at all. Now that number is getting smaller and smaller, but you've seen those landing pages, right? The ones that go on for a million miles and have little PayPal screenshots of "Look how much money I made," and testimonials that go on forever, and like the weird handwriting offer on the price. We've all seen those. There are people that respond to that. And then there are other people that don't respond to that. I was in a Facebook group on a WordPress group this morning and someone was talking about software and they said, oh, ClickFunnels style landing page, I'm out. Just because the landing page had a tone of voice similar to the way ClickFunnels sells. Now ClickFunnels focuses a lot on the, you know, the direct marketers, so people selling supplements, coaching, that sort of thing. But again, there are groups of people that respond to that. So think about the audience and try different things because you never know what will work. There are people that respond better to non-responsive websites. Yes, I know it's crazy. Websites should always be responsive, but it's true. It's a very small number. I'm not saying to make your websites non-responsive, but my point is you want to try different things as you're doing these tests. So let's talk about the 2016 and now the 2020 election. Hey, um, I, I uh, love talking about this because politics are always one of those things that is safe to talk about. And no one ever gets upset when, you know, you get unsolicited unsolic advice from strangers. Right. I promise I am not going to share a side or talk about the politics, but um, American politics in particular are really interesting for A-B testing because they on both sides of the aisle republicans and democrats because they use a b testing for so many different things they use it to know what will get people to donate more is probably one of the biggest things they do i've signed up i signed up for all the mailing lists this campaign cycle both trump and both biden and all this stuff i was getting texts and different emails and things i was getting the same email from different people on the Trump campaign on my different email addresses um, based on how I was interacting with the clicks and stuff previously. Um, sometimes they would come from Donald Trump. Sometimes they would come from Mike Pence. Sometimes they would come from Kellyanne Conway. Other times it would say, hey, we need your X dollar amount now. Sometimes that email, I got the same email five times in my different email boxes when I was testing this. Sometimes it's like, we need your $500 donation urgently right now. Same email, same time, it said $3 in another box. They were doing this testing to see what will convert the most based on the audience. And then they're segmenting those tests, which we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so that is super, uh, super uh, interesting. So we'll talk about some examples. Um, so this is a picture from the 2016 this was five days before the general election in 2016. donald trump on his official website and facebook page said donate money and you will get your name live on my facebook page 
And he did. He raised millions of dollars. And this, what, the way they did it, the way that they did it was a live webcam of a laser printer printing out names for five straight hours. I'm not making this up. This is an exact screenshot from the stream. Now, we can all laugh and say, oh, they're technically inept, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and every once in a while, a hand would come in with a little call to action, handwritten note that said, still time to donate, blah, blah, blah. This was deliberate. They knew who their audience was, and they tested it. Earlier that same year, they did the same campaign at the Republican National Convention. But that was very high-tech polished. It was, it was on the mega screen. You had a picture of your name on the screen emailed to you. It had nice transitions and said where you were from and everything. They and it didn't do as well, even though it it was kind of a cooler you know gimmick if you kind of think about it. Hillary Clinton did different th different tests. Um, you know, one of the things that worked really well for Hillary Clinton donations on her A/B testing was the chance to win experiences. So last, you know, 2016, Hillary Clinton would be like, donate to have a chance to see Hamilton with me. Donate to have a chance to get a signed copy of my book. Um, all of those things worked really well. You know what, uh, this year, what the Democrats did a ton of is they had ticketed fundraisers with high level talent. So like the cast of Parks and Recreation or the cast of Star Trek would come on and you'd have to donate to get your ticket. And it would just be them, you know, talking for like an hour. And they did that hundreds of times and raised millions and millions of dollars. And how do we know they raised millions of dollars? Because in the U.S., all donations are reported to, um, you know, the government so that we know. Um, you know, making sure that the campaigns are being honest on their finance disclosures. Um, again, I am not saying which is good or bad. Um, if anything is good or bad, I just find it incredibly interesting. Um, and stop playing it safe. Like, really, like, we, in the web space, we'll, like, try one thing and we'll be like, oh, it didn't work. Or we'll have an idea that's crazy. And we... We, we won't do it because we think the client won't like it. Now, that being said, if you are doing this on behalf of somebody, please make sure to get all changes approved of a people so you're not using their assets in a way that they won't like. But sometimes the crazy stuff really, really works. I mean, think about this. The Wendy's Twitter handle. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. I don't even like, I don't even like Wendy's. And plant-based vegan, so I don't eat there. But they are savage. They have some A-level trolling going on. And it it works. It gets them noticed. And it probably wouldn't pass a lot of people's, you know, sniff test as being acceptable for a corporate brand to say. But they own it. And they do a good job at it. Um, for example, you know, Chick-fil-A tweeted. Um, for those who don't know, Chick-fil-A is a... Uh, kind of a faith-based uh, chicken sandwich restaurant here in the U.S. Um, and I think they have some international locations. But they're not open on Sunday. No Chick-fil-A's are open on Sunday. That's what they're famously known for. Um, so they said, what is better than eating a fresh chicken sandwich? And then, you know, Wendy's tweeted having it on a Sunday. And they've said things that are even far um, more funny. But you can, like, Google Wendy's funny tweets and you'll find all sorts of stuff. Stop playing it safe. Again, one out of every four tests, one of them should be crazy. And those crazy things will make all difference in the world. Um, so a quick hit list of some things to try. Don't laugh until you try them. Professional versus unprofessional. Um, again, this can go for style and language. Sometimes unprofessional stuff works. Uh, for example, the Trump campaign just tweeted trying to get money for their recount efforts on challenging the election. Um, fraud that they claim happened um, and they're like final notice like it was a debt collection letter but again it's working so you know professional versus unprofessional try the different things figure out who the avatar is um, and you know do that photo versus illustration sometimes illustrations works better clip arts if you can do custom illustration that's great you can use services like Fiverr um, to get that stuff created for you if you don't have the skills or something to do it in-house 
uh, one color versus another color, very easy to do. Just test two different colors. Also, when you're testing colors, make sure to look up the WCAG 2.0 accessibility contrast guidelines, because if you're testing, you might as well test accessible versus non-accessible, although everything should always be accessible, because usually accessibility will convert better than non-accessible sites. And one out of every four adults is covered by something under the WCAG 2.0 guidelines. So just being having accessibility contrast ratios and colors and things and font sizes um, is just a good idea. A low brightness contrast versus high brightness contrast again, you know, uh, see what works, see what doesn't. Border versus no border. Um, again, this goes with images. Uh, I suppose you could do it with the surfboard again. Uh, clear image versus blurry image, sometimes blurry images. And I don't mean out of focus, like artistic, sometimes legitimate blurry images um, do work better. Um, they give kind of like a homemade feel to it. Um, static versus animated, sometimes animated images or GIFs work better. Um, static things work better sometimes. Ugly versus sex appeal, sometimes things that are, you know, that just generally just don't look aesthetically a ple pe a pleasing do work better because they make seem more natural we all see this a lot right um whenever there's like a you know those those local tv commercials adverts and they're always like you know a guy uh, and they always have that weird local feel to it and it's like bill from the sales floor is you know saying this is why i should get you in this toyota today and you know there might be a polar bear in the background or whatever but it it works to a certain type of um audience Professional stock photos versus amateur and formal photos. We talked about this again. Uh, one layout versus another layout, you know, vertical versus horizontal, um, two column versus three column, one column, etc. cetera. Uh, one call to action versus another call to action. You know, maybe it's the same call to action, but phrased differently like half off or say 50% today. Um, the terms like up to work pretty well. Images versus text only. Sometimes having a text only um, landing page or call to action actually works better yeah it might seem weird to have a block of text but if it um, changes the the viewing um, aspect of way people are kind of viewing it it is nice to um, get them to stop and actually read your content uh, upright versus angled you know stuff is skewed sometimes converts better uh, blue line versus a, a blue button very easy uh, regular border versus false border and drop shadow. There's our friend the drop shadow again from that test I told you about. Um, custom ad design versus familiar UI elements. We've all seen those ads or those layouts that like make it look like it's Facebook or Instagram. I'm not saying, um, you know, may have people think that they're interacting with those apps. But, you know, having the things like the like buttons or the layouts and those sort of things, um, you know, sometimes convert better. Original image versus mirror image. Um, go back to our duck photo. Left duck, right duck. Uh, the right facing duck actually converted more. And I always ask, why would the right facing duck convert more? A lot of people are like, oh, it's because it's, is the beak pointing towards the call to action? Is the, you know, and I always get the answer like one of every four times I give this talk, because the duck is looking into the future. Well, yeah, well, the duck's not psychic. I don't know why it's converted better, but at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter and we'll kind of talk about that in a second uh standard ad shape versus custom ad shape you know uh try things like triangles or diamonds on your css so it's not just a circle uh positive versus negative sometimes positive connotation language or imagery converts better sometimes negative i once did a campaign for a product that stopped fires and we tested everything from protect your hand you know, protect your family, you know, invest in all this. But the people that were buying it were people that were getting it for their elderly parents. They test, be testing the language. It's like, if you don't have this, your parents are going to burn the house down and it's going to be your fault. Um, I'm not saying I'm proud of that work, but it converted and the client was happy. So at the end of the day, you know, um, you think about ways to do that inside your comfort zone. Uh, generic versus relevant to the time period. Like, do you want a girlfriend by Christmas? Or do you want a girlfriend if it's a dating site? Um, you know, sometimes tying into the time period um, or current events. And that being said, uh, don't do like virtue signaling. Like, you know, oh, in these difficult times, COVID, don't feel ungenuine because um, being genuine above anything else converts better because people believe what you're saying. 
uh, mention discounts uh, and prices versus leave it a mist. We've all seen those sites where you have to log in to see the price or add it to the cart. Sometimes there's restrictions that they can't show the price unless they have intent to buy, but a lot of times it's just a sales tactic because once you have it in your cart, you're more likely to finish the checkout process. Um, trust logos versus no trust logos, things like the Better Business Bureau um, and other sort of things. Sometimes those convert better, sometimes those don't. If you're using anyone else's logos, make sure you have permission to use them. I know in the States, you can't use the Better Business Bureau logo unless you pay a licensing fee, even if you're a member. And you basically just got to have all of, you know, the things that all come together to ask this. So we've talked about a lot of different things that unlike, you know, uh, can help with A-B testing and everyone says, well, why does it convert better? Why would this convert better than the others? You know, what the duck? And bottom line is it doesn't matter. Yes, I can get into human psychology and I'm not a psych professor and I'm not an expert in human behavior but I am an expert in testing and I can move needles until I find that button and it's a magic money machine. Because imagine if you could tell a client, you're like, I want to do monthly A-B testing on your stuff. Okay, great. Um, and uh, this is the exact language I tell my clients when I was doing this. I have a ma your website's a magic money machine. And if you give me $10 and if I give you 15, how many dollars will you give me? They'll laugh and then make them tell you a number. They say, well, I'll give you unlimited dollars. That's all you're doing when you go back to the goal and say, okay, what's your KPI? What are the numbers that are make you happy? Because you're using your magic money machine, in this case, Modic, to make more money than the, you are putting into it. And you're using data to prove it. So uh, with, uh, uh, with that, um, I would... Uh, Love to answer your questions. Um, we have a little bit of time. We have probably about 10 minutes before the transition, eight, 10 minutes. Um, I want to thank you so much for spending it with, uh, spending your time with me. Um, my contact information is up there again. Again, it's uh, webventures.io if you need to email me, but Twitter is probably the best. So um, do we have any questions? And you can also use the link at the bottom to submit your questions as well. Okay, well, if we don't have any questions, that is cool. Um, I think we're probably going to end it here. We'll let you get a cup of coffee or a snack before the next talk. Um, I would love to talk to you on Twitter or any of your other social networks. Um, until then, uh, my name is Mike Demo, and I am so happy you spent your afternoon with me. and Enjoy the rest of Modicon.